Hello, welcome to our last week of lecture for the summer semester. Summer semesters always go so fast and I can't believe we're almost to the end. Uh, today we're talking about the Renaissance and that's going to talk about the Hundred Years War, which is kind of the, the end of the Middle Ages and the beginning of the Renaissance. We're going to talk about the Southern or Italian Renaissance and we're going to talk about the Northern Renaissance as well. So there's really three different topics to talk about in this one video. All right, the Hundred Years' War, first thing you'll notice, 1337 to 1453, it actually lasted longer than a Hundred Years' War, but it's just called the Hundred Years' War for simplicity. Now, there are two different ways you can look at this. There's the underlying or the long-term causes, or there's the immediate cause, the, the match that starts the fire, so to speak. Now, the long-term causes, by the time we get to 1337, the English land holdings in France have started to decline. England used to own more of France than what the French king did, but by 1337 that has changed. So the English kings, they want to regain their large land holdings in France that they had way back in the days of Henry II, but they lost them under King John, who was during the, the uh, Third Crusade in the 1200s. The French, by contrast, they want to retain what they would acquired in the past 100, 150 years, and then they want to drive the English completely out of France. So the English want to stay in France, the French want the English out. Then there's this problem with the wool trade. Wool from England was sent across the English Channel to what is modern-day Belgium, but back then it was called Flanders. And in the late 1200s, early 1300s, the French, they're going to try to take control of Flanders. And that's going to disrupt the wool trade. And that causes a problem for the English king because the English king, a lot of their money came from the tax on wool going to Flanders. There's also this demand for glory. And the only way you could get glory through chivalry was either saving a damsel in distress or fighting on the battlefield. And there are only so many damsels in distress that you can save, which means that warriors, knights, soldiers, they have to find battlefield glory. And then last but not least, neither France or England, they're able, neither one's able to solve their internal issues uh, they're not able to solve their internal social issues, their internal economic issues, their internal political issues. And the leaders of both kingdoms think that a war is going to divert the attention from home, unite everybody together in the name of patriotism. So those are the long-term causes of this war. Now, the immediate cause, like the reason it happened, is a dispute over the French throne. Now, here's my family tree of the kings of France. And it goes back a little while to the, what year is that? Philip III is going to become king in 1270, and he's going to be king all the way until 1285. In 1285, it's going to become Philip IV, his son, who is king. And Philip IV will be king from 1285 until 1314. Now, Philip IV has a couple of sons. You've got Louis X, who will become king in 1314 and reign until 1316. Louis has one son named John. John will become king in 1316 only. He dies five days after he's born. Now that death is going to end the three centuries of father to, to son secession to the French throne. And of course, because John I died as an infant, he he can't possibly have had a kid. So we've got a problem here now. In the French system, it has to be the next closest male relative. 
In this case, it's going to go all the way back up to John's uncle, Philip V. Now, Philip V will become king from 1316 all the way until 1322. Philip dies, and you've got Charles. Charles reigns from 1322 until 1328. Charles has absolutely no kids. So in theory, this should be the end of this line of kings because the next closest relative is Isabella of Venois. Isabella of Venois cannot become king because there were no male kings at the time. You're, you couldn't even become a queen. But what the crown could do is go to Edward II of England. Now, Edward II of England had a pretty strong claim to being the king of France. His mother was Margaret of France, who was the daughter of Philip III, and he married into the line by marrying one of Philip IV's daughters. So yes, that does mean that Edward II was technically inbred, if you will, or the family tree didn't branch that far, but it's how royalty worked back then. So you got ink. Edward II of England, he's going to die before Charles does, which leaves their son, Edward III. Edward III should be the king of both England and France. Everything on this chart flowed through to Edward III. Edward III was the rightful king. But what happens? Philip III has another kid that's not on the list. Why didn't I put him on the list? Because he never, ever, 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 ever should have been king. Once it passed that part of the line, you can't go that far back up. So you got Philip of Valois. He was a son of Charles, grandson of Philip III. He's chosen as the next king, even though he isn't even on the list of candidates. Edward III pretty angry. Edward III is going to send a letter to the French government in 1337 demanding his crown because he says, I am the true king of France. Now the French government, there's no way they're going to let this English monarch become the king. So they're going to change the law. I'm going to go back to screen here. They changed the law that says you cannot pass the crown through the female line. That takes out Margaret of France. That also takes out Isabella of Benoit. And that takes out all of the Edwards from being the king of France. Now, once again, the significance of this is it's already past this point. There's no going back. But the French government thinks if they pass a law and say, oh, this applied 30 years ago, then nobody's going to complain. Well, Edward complains. Edward feels so cheated by this that he is going to declare war on France and he is going to fight to claim the throne that is his. So how does this war play out? Um, I'll be truthful with you. Nothing I say is going to do it justice because some schools have an entire semester just on this one war alone. Uh, what I will tell you, though, is the war is fought almost completely on French soil. French agriculture is devastated. The armies in this war are commanded by the princes of the monarchs themselves, like Edward the Black Prince. He's actually going to be fighting. Kings are actually going to be fighting. And the outcome of this, it, there are going to be so many people that lose their lives that Europe has to find labor-saving devices to get more work done out of those who still live. This is also going to change the way warfare is done. After this war is over, 
Europe is going to start turning to cannon and muskets and gunpowder-based weapons. Now, large numbers of people are going to be fighting. Over 10% of the French, over 10% of the English are going to be involved in this. That's huge for those times. Uh, the English army, it's led by the longbowmen and the foot soldiers. The English army is a professional army. The English army is paid for by the crown, by the king which means that they're loyal to the King of England. The French army, on their hand, is cavalry, horse soldiers, uh, foot soldiers, and then crossbowmen. Now, they are loyal to and paid for by the local lords, and then it's the local lords who are loyal to the King of France. So the soldiers aren't loyal to the King of France. They're loyal to the lord right above them who pays their paycheck. So you have two different armies. You have a professional army that works directly for the king, or you have an army that works for the local lords who then has allegiance to the king. Now that's going to be a big difference because English army, they're going to fight for the one that pays for the paycheck. The French army, they're not actually fighting for the king. They're, they're fighting for the, the one who owns the land they live on. Now there are three battles I want you to know. There's the Battle of Crecy, and that happens in 1346. This is going to be the French crossbowmen versus English longbow. Um, the, the longbow is about six feet long, and it fires a steel-tipped arrow. And it's dangerous at 400 yards away, and it's deadly at 100 yards away. It's not as accurate as a crossbow, but you can launch three arrows for every one crossbow bolt the French can do. Now the crossbow, it is more accurate, but it takes a lot longer to reload. And it is also known to misfire and fire prematurely. And it's just, it's not as good of a weapon just because of the amount of time it takes to load. So what happens is you have all these French longbowmen launching three arrows for every one French crossbow bolt. So there's this blinding shower of arrows that come down on the French cavalry and on the French crossbowmen. Mass confusion ensues. And to top that off, the, the English are going to use cannons, not for their firepower, but for the noise. And the noise is going to scare the horses even more. The Battle of Crecy is a huge defeat for the French. <clears throat> the English win. A second battle happens in 1356 at Poitiers. The French king is actually on the ground fighting, and King John II, who is the French king in 1356, is captured. And he goes to England as a prisoner of war. Once the French king has been captured, the French army it just starts to fall apart. There's nobody to leave. The French king is being taken prisoner, the French king is being held for ransom, and it looks like the English are going to win this war. In 1415, we have the Battle of Agincourt, which is one of the most famous battles of all time. England has somewhere between 6,000 and 9,000 soldiers. The French have somewhere between 15,000 and 36,000. Now, why is that such a big range? It's because each French knight had a, a squire with them, a, a servant, if you will. And researchers and historians aren't sure exactly how many of those squires or servants fought and how much were just pure servants. But we know 15,000 is the, the least number of people who could have been fighting, 36,000 is the most. Well, what's the result? The English lose somewhere around 500 people. The French lose somewhere around 6,000 people. 
The French have so many soldiers taken captive that the English king orders these captives to be executed for their own protection. In reality, though, it looks like not that many prisoners were actually killed. But either way you look at it, it's a humiliating defeat for the French. So it really looks like the French are, are going to lose. But this is where the famous Joan of Arc comes in. Joan of Arc. She is a 17-year-old who is a shepherd, and she has the vision of getting the future Charles VII crowned king. And her vision tells her that if she can get the future Charles VII crowned king, that France will win the war. So she's going to lead an army to the city of Orleans, or Orléans, as it said in French. She's going to rescue Prince Charles. She's then going to lead the same army to the city of Rheims. And Charles will be crowned king in the Cathedral of Rheims, which was the only place that the French king could possibly be crowned. While she's in Rheims, because it was in enemy territory, she's captured by the Burgundians. The Burgundians were French who were loyal to the English. The Burgundians are going to sell Joan of Arc to the English, and Joan of Arc is going to be put on trial as a witch. They're going to try her for heresy against religion. And on May 30th, 1431, in the city of Rouen, she is going to be burned at the stake. So how does Joan of Arc lead to the French winning this war? Well, she's going to stimulate French pride. She's going to rally the French troops. And she's going to show the French that they have a chance. At the same time this is going on, the English people, they're demanding an end to the war because of the loss of life and the amount of money that it was costing. By the time this ends, the English Parliament is going to refuse to send any more money to France to help the king get his lands back. And the English Parliament is going to say, if you want to keep fighting, king, you're going to have to pay for it yourself. By the end of the war, only the coast of Normandy and the city of Calais remain English possession. The rest of France will belong to the French. Now, what are the overall impacts of this war? Well, England is going to be financially devastated. It costs so much money to fight that financially England is bankrupt. There are also so many aristocratic men of childbearing age that the aristocracy, they can't carry on. Um, entire families die out. And there are very few nobles who can trace their lineage back before 1450. If you are of English descent, try to do it on Ancestry.com. And when you get to the 1400s, you're probably going to run into a dead end. The birth rate was extremely low because so many young men died. And it takes a long time for the population to begin to recover. The wool trade in Flanders is almost totally destroyed, which leads the English developing their own domestic wool trade. And that is going to eventually lead to what we know today as the Industrial Revolution. If the Hundred Years' War hadn't happened, who knows what would have happened with the Industrial Revolution. The war weakened the king further and strengthened the English Parliament even more. And it turned out that the English Parliament is going to be in charge of all tax legislation shortly after the war happens. England's also going to experience the War of the Roses, which is a huge civil war where Henry Tudor finally wins after defeating Richard III. And then England no longer has to worry about France. England is able to go and look at other territories. And because England is no longer involved with France, they begin a huge period of overseas expansion. Now what happens to France 
There's a huge population loss and there's thousands of acres of farmland destroyed. And that's simply because France is where most of the fighting happened. There's an almost total breakdown of law and order until Joan of Arc appears and her miraculous saving of the monarch uh, results in the French people thinking that their monarch was chosen by God. And this is going to increase the French king's power. The French king's going to become more independent financially because most of the rebellious nobles are killed off, which makes it easier for the king of France to govern. And in France, the estates general, their form of parliament, doesn't meet for hundreds of years. France is also going to redo their military. They're going to rely on artillery. They're going to lessen their need for the cavalry. And they're going to let the lower nobility and sons of middle class men enter military service for the first time. And those military men from these lower classes are able to gain rank through the military very quickly. And the most famous of these lower military ranks who gain notoriety will be Napoleon a couple hundred years later. Now, what about the Renaissance? What does this have to do? Well, the Renaissance, it's not a momentary thing. It is a gradual thing. And it goes from 1300 to 1600. And there are two real hallmarks. There are two things that happen. The people in Europe, especially Southern Europe, such as Italy, become hostile to the culture of the Middle Ages. They don't look at the past, the immediate past, I should say, fondly. What they do look at, though, is ancient Rome and ancient Greece, and they have desires and wants to recreate those times. This love affair with the ancient works leads to an increasing literacy in Latin and an increasing literacy in Greek, and the term Renaissance it refers to this rebirth of the classic Greek in their own ways. Now, the people doing this, it's not like everybody wakes up and says, hmm, I'm going to be uh, enlightened and renaissance today. It's really just this relatively small group of educated elites. And then it will spread slowly from those educated elites. And it becomes cool. It becomes the cool thing to do to study ancient Greek and ancient Latin again. Another question you may have is why was it in Italy? And it's because Italy was never united. Italy remained city-states all through their history. So there's no strong feudalistic society. There's no one king to rule them all. Uh, there's a lot of money in Italy as well, and people want to spend it. I mean, you've got the Medici family in Florence, and they are the personal bankers for the Pope. Uh, the Catholic Church was bringing in a lot of money, which meant the Medicis had their hands in a lot of money. But it wasn't just the Medicis, it was everybody in Italy. And when they had money, they wanted to show off their money by buying nice houses, buying nice painting, buying nice sculptures, and just doing nice things. You add to that the urban nature of Italy, where people could just share ideas instead of having to go you know, across their manors, you know, dozens of miles to meet their neighbor. Uh, people talked a lot in Italy. And then last but not least, Italy is the site of the Roman Republic. Italy is the site of the Roman Empire. And the Italians would look around and say, hmm, I wish we could recreate the glory of Rome. Now, what is the Renaissance about? It's about the individual. The Renaissance is all about consumerism. It's all about individuality. It's all about me, 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 if you will. For example, 
the Renaissance writers are the ones who invent the autobiography. Now, an autobiography, that is a book that you write a, by yourself about yourself. Now, that means that you, the reader, you're not just interested in the author's life, but you're also interested enough in the author's life to see what they think about themselves. The Renaissance writers and the Renaissance thinkers, they are proud of their abilities. They do not like Christian humility, and they want their names to be known. They want credit for their work. For example, when the public thought that uh, Donatello had sculpted the Pieta, Michelangelo broke into the St. Peter's Cathedral in the middle of the night and carved his name across the Virgin Mary's dress so everybody would know he was the artist. Um, people started to wear fancy dress. They pay more attention to their manners. They start to take baths and worry about personal hygiene. You also have Renaissance thinkers who are concerned about acquiring wealth and displaying wealth. And paintings are often full of desirable worldly objects, if you will. Like the Virgin Mary would be painted with a Maserati or a, a Porsche or something like that in today's world. Also, at the same time, paintings become more numerous because they're cheaper to produce, which meant that more people could afford art and art could be circulated more freely. So the Renaissance creators, because they know that there's a way to make money because people want to buy their products, they look for ways to make things quicker. And clocks are going to be used for the first time in large numbers. In the medieval period, in the Middle Ages, the world was kind of timeless, but now the Renaissance is obsessed with time and obsessed with numbers. Almost every village has a clock in the center of village to educate peasants about the new ideas of time and the new ideas of order. Renaissance thinkers, they see numbers as just numbers. Numbers are completely neutral. They have no special characteristics. They have no religious meaning. That's different from the Middle Ages. In the Middle Ages, medieval scholars, they would see six as a perfect number, or they would see three as representing the Trinity. But to Renaissance thinkers, six was just a number, three was just a number, nothing else. We actually have a form of Renaissance quantification that's used daily. If you're somebody who listens to music, the music staff was Europe's first graph, and the music staff was Europe's first large-scale timekeeping device. We're also going to get a form of philosophy in the Renaissance known as humanism. And humanism is going to involve the study of classics, and I mean Roman and Greek classics, to create a new definition of what made man human. Um, there's a famous thinker named Erasmus, who I'll talk about in a few minutes, who says men are made, not born. It's no longer just enough to be born, but you have to make something of yourself. You have to become educated to be seen as truly human. Now, humanists, they are not anti-religion. They feel that man is the best of God's creatures other than angels. And this led to the humanists kind of looking at the world a little differently. They saw themselves as being worthy of God's creation a little bit. Now, Humanists, they looked a lot at Greek philosophers. And they tried to look at Greek philosophy and interpret Greek philosophy on its own. And what I mean by that is in medieval times, the medieval scholars would look at Aristotle 
and they would try to mold it into Christianity. They would say that Aristotle knew that Christ was coming and he was sending a Christian message, etc., etc. But the Renaissance thinkers said, no, Aristotle wrote hundreds of years before Jesus walked the earth, and Aristotle was just writing philosophy for the ancient Greeks. So they looked at Aristotle and Plato and Socrates differently. They tried to understand it for what it is. And that very often meant taking out the Christian meaning. You have Renaissance art. Renaissance art is very much focused on presenting people as they are. Most of the people buying art are just everyday patrons like bankers or lawyers. They're no longer church clergy. And this meant that art was mainly and mostly freed from religion, which permitted themes and treatments that would have been off limit to the church. Uh, for example, in individual portraits, the sitter is presented as they sat, warts and, and blemishes and all. The human body is going to be presented in a very scientific and natural manner. Uh, Gal or not Galileo, like Michelangelo would pay people to dig up dead bodies so that he could dissect them and figure out how the bones and how the muscles work so that he could draw everything exactly. And by the way, if the church had known Michelangelo was doing that, Michelangelo probably would have been excommunicated. There are new technologies such as oil painting. Oil painting allowed richer, deeper colors and it required much less speed to produce than the old school frescoes because frescoes were basically colored plaster and you could only do one layer of plaster at a time. Oil paintings could be done further north where it was wetter and colder. And that is something that really worked to the favor of Leonardo da Vinci. Some other famous artists of the day, Albrecht Dürer, uh, he refused to do oil paintings because they took so much time. So he would make wood block prints. Uh, Albrecht Dürer, he would make one sculpture or one painting out of wood, and then he would use paint to stamp that block print and make copies of it. Pretty smart if you ask me. And one really famous piece of literature that you need to know is The Prince by Niccolo Machiavelli. The Prince. This is basically a how-to manual for his patrons in Florence. Um, he is going to write and teach the leaders and the, the rulers of the city of Florence how to keep a firm grasp on their city. So it's got all sorts of harsh advice. It's got information on murdering, betraying, basically whatever it takes to stay in power, while also giving the people of Florence just enough to keep them on your side. And it is considered one of the first political science works of all time. I've read it before. It's a pretty interesting book. And yes, Machiavelli does say it's okay to kill somebody if you need to. Now we come to the Northern Renaissance. Uh, eventually, the Renaissance is going to move into Northern Europe. And there are a couple of reasons this, this happens. It's right around 1500 this happens. First of all, students who are studying in Italy begin to carry the ideas of the Italian Renaissance back home with them to the north. You also have Spanish and French armies who are constantly invading Italy. The soldiers are exposed to Renaissance ideas and then they take them home with them. And then finally, uh, we have movable type printing, which meant that books could be made easier and cheaper. And those books are going to spread Renaissance ideas too. What are the biggest differences between the Northern and Southern Renaissance? In the South, in Italy, the patrons are the wealthy elite, the middle class, the upper class. But in Northern Europe, the patrons are still going to be kings and princes and monarchs. 
both the Northern and the Southern Renaissance are going to analyze old works. The Southern Renaissance is going to analyze ancient Greek and Roman works, while the Northern Renaissance is going to go back and research and analyze the original Christian works. So that means that the Northern Renaissance, they're going to look at the works of St. Paul and St. Peter, things like that. And there's a little more variation in the northern background. Not all people in the north are wealthy. Not all people in the north are elite. Northern Renaissance thinkers are more willing to write for the, quote, common man. The best known northern Renaissance figure is going to be Erasmus. He was a Christian, but he's also a humanist. And he tries to blend the new idea of uh, humanities with the traditions of Christianity. So he's all about patience, calmness, being broad, broad-minded, while also having love, faith, and hope. And he is going to become a early reformer of the Christian church because of his blending of humanism to the religion. He creates a new version of the Christian Bible. He believes in education for everybody. And he really tries to do his best to make Christianity open to all. Now, what about Northern Renaissance art? The Northern Renaissance art has much more of the deep religious feeling. It has much more spiritualism than the South does. For portraits, this, the person sitting, they will still have this attitude of prayer. There's, they'll still be looking up at the heavens, but they'll be painted with all their warts and such. The architecture of the North stayed mostly Gothic because they believed that was the best Christian architecture. And you have, of course, Albert Durer, who does his wood prints, but he also comes up with the idea of perspective. Albert Durer is one of the first people to use colors and imaging to create a 3D painting. And then finally, there's Peter Bruegel. Peter Bruegel, uh, he does this picture, this painting on the top right, known as the Slaughter of the Innocents. And it looks like it's supposed to be Roman soldiers attacking a village, but what it really is is Spanish soldiers attacking a Belgian village. So there's this mix of religion and humanism in the north that we do not find in the south. The northern renaissance is much more influenced by Christianity still. Now what about renaissance life? I know we haven't talked about the Protestant Reformation yet, that is the next video, but still, you know they exist, so I'm okay giving you this slide right here. In the renaissance, marriage for Catholics was dominated primarily by economic factors. It was not about love, it was not about physical attraction. Men needed to have sufficient land before marrying, which meant that they usually had to wait until their father died or gave them land. That meant marriages were fairly late for the time, and there were not as many children. There was no such thing as divorce. Divorce in the Catholic Church did not exist at the time. But even though divorce didn't exist, marriage was extremely easy. All it took to be married in the eyes of the Catholic Church was an oral promise between two partners. Now, of course, the church preferred to have those vows done in church, in the church setting, but it wasn't always required. It just took a promise. Now, that meant that there were some difficulties. If one party claimed that a promise was made in secret, while the other one said no, it wasn't, that could lead to grievances being held up in church court for years. Now, the Protestants, they changed the concept of marriage, praising it as a noble estate. They believed that it was freeing to the woman. 
uh, the Protestants saw the Catholics as being anti-feminist. Now, uh, the way they wrap their head around this is the Protestants argued that putting a woman in a home would liberate them from sexual repression, would liberate them from cultural deprivation, and would give them a role in the world, if you will. In other words, it's better to be married than to be a nun. Protestants rejected the idea of marriage as a sacrament, which meant that they were okay with divorce. Still wasn't easy, though. Um, Protestants also argued in favor of sexual and spiritual equality, and because of that, they passed laws against wife beating. In the Catholic Church at the time, you could beat your wife without any problems. The Protestants say, no, 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 you can't do that. And so women joined the Protestant faith hoping to escape abusive relationships. Also, Protestants, they were okay with contraception. Um, for example, Penny Royal, Queen Anne's Lace, and Myrtle were all used to prevent pregnancy. And there was actually a 70% effectiveness rate on either preventing or terminating pregnancies in the Renaissance amongst Protestants. Now, that's not saying that pregnancy didn't happen. In fact, pregnancy happened a lot more often than today. Um, women, if you're listening to this, you were going to have a children every 24 to 30 months on average, and you would have your first child, especially for Protestant, around the age of 18. And of course, there's a 10% or more chance of dying in, in childbirth. And each child you have, it gets a little bit more risky. Children born in the city died twice as fast as the ones in the country, and that had a lot to do with pollution and disease. And if you were, quote, an extra daughter, meaning if you were the second daughter or the third daughter, you were going to be sent away to be a nun because there was only so much money that could be given away. And that always went with the firstborn. Witchcraft is also a thing. You might be familiar with the Salem Witch Trials here in the Americas. Uh, the Salem Witch Trials actually happened fairly late in the witch craze. Uh, the witch craze really starts around 1450 and it ends in the early 1600s. And throughout Europe, there are over 200,000 people who are killed for being witches. And like five out of six of them were women, 85%. So there's this women's subculture that is under this pressure of these witch hunts. Um, inquisitors would pursue women who knew one, of, one another, and women would point fingers at their female friends. And the, the idea came for women, or the idea became, I should say, that women were in fear of one another because they didn't trust each other. Food, this is different too. Uh, there's no refrigeration. And so for food to last over the long winter, it had to be either salted or dried. So preserved herring became a big food, um, salted pork, beef jerky type thing. Uh, those all became really big. Uh, to actually eat the food, it would have to be soaked repeatedly through different changes of water. And all of this water would have to be drawn from a well. So it was actually really hard to eat this food. Very often things like beans are cooked with the food because they would absorb the salt that couldn't be rinsed out. And so the food that they ate was very salty, very bland. And because of that it was served with spicy sauces. And they had two main sauces. They had a yellow sauce made out of ginger and saffron, and they had a green sauce made of ginger, cardamom, cloves, and green herbs, kind of like a pesto today. Pepper was actually used as currency because it was so expensive. Now just imagine pepper being used as a currency because it was so so expensive. 
They were almost non-existent table manners. Everybody ate with their hands, and everybody dipped their hands in the same water. So they thought that their hands were clean, but in reality, they weren't. Also, no forks. Forks were seen as dangerous weapons. On top of that, very few people took baths, so you have people scratching their lice and their fleas right there at the dinner table. It was a much different experience than today. Two other changes that happened. There's a change in warfare. You gather these large armies that are really expensive to maintain. Um, there's this use of gunpowder. There's the use of cannons. And instead of everybody shooting at once, they fire in rounds or salvos. Not only that, but drafts or conscription starts. And in some cases, the armies are so big and so expensive that they aren't even used. They're just for show. Then we also have the printing press. And the printing press, again, is going to speed up the, the way that ideas are shared. And books are going to become cheaper and faster to produce. The idea of page numbers are going to be introduced as well so that everybody could be literally on the same page if you talk about the idea. All right, that's it for this video. I'll be back in a few minutes with another video. If you have any questions about the Renaissance, just feel free to send me an email. I'll talk to you a little bit.